Hello ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, I am Barry Tadcaster, this is my uh, friend Ken Jevons, the Orang Pendek, and uh, welcome to another episode of Lenditrak. Tajikistan is a landlocked country in Central Asia, rich in culture, history and wildlife. It is covered by the Pamir mountain range. It is full of lakes, grasslands and there are leopards, snow leopards and lynx. Some people believe that the Caspian tiger, which is supposed to be extinct, and the Asiatic cheetah, which is now down to less than 50 animals confined to central Iran, may still survive there. There are two species of wolf, jackals, bears and all sorts of other exciting creatures. But what else could be there? We're uh, just getting together our equipment for the latest CFZ expedition, uh, including the old uh, camera traps that have gone just about every expedition we've ever done, and uh, the relatively new night vision camera, wonderfully compact little thing, and uh, you can take pictures from a distance of about 100 feet with this in pitch black and it's a really great bit of kit. The new expedition is to Tajikistan in former Soviet Central Asia and we're going to be concentrating on the Romit Valley. Uh, we're going to be looking for a creature called the Dev or Gul, the local names for it. It's almost certainly the same creature as uh, the Almasti of the Russian Caucasus Mountains, a relic hominid that is almost certainly a relative of one of the ancestors of man, perhaps an early offshoot of Homo erectus or Homo habilis. Taken so seriously by the Russians that in the Soviet years they had a commission to look for it. Uh, we've also been talking to a journalist called Ben Judah and uh, ten years ago he went up into the same area, the Romit Valley, and he said the people up there, uh, he met the shepherds and so forth, almost everyone had either seen one of these creatures or knew someone had seen them. But uh, this was only in wooded areas. When he went higher into the Pamir Mountains and, and the woodland stopped, he went above the tree line, the story stopped as well. So if these were just fairy tales, they'd carry on above the tree line. But they seem to be descriptions of a biologically valid creature. The expedition is being majorly financed by our old friend Chris Clark, who's been on just about every CFZ expedition going. Why Tajikistan, you might ask? Well, Chris has always wanted to go there. It's always been a passion of his, and he's been talking about it for years and years and years. So he's finally decided to take the plunge and, and go to Tajikistan. And we have relatively recent accounts of uh, relic hominids there. And it seems that when Ben visited the area, there were many sightings. That was about 10 years ago. So. Hopefully the area is, is just as productive today. I've never been to Tajikistan, I know very little about it, so it will be uh, an interesting trip all round. We're looking forward to see what Richard has in store for us next month, but in the meantime, there's always something exciting in gardens just like this one here. There are three species of lizard known to be native to the United Kingdom, and two of them have been found in the CFZ grounds within the last year. These are the most common. Slow worms are only species of legless lizard. And Carl found this pair of remarkably amorous slow worms the other day. I always think it's funny that the lizards, obviously this is a lizard, it's not a snake, the lizards are always quite aggressive to each other when they mate. I mean, snakes have got like a reputation for being aggressive and they're actually quite romantic really when they couple. Got a little scar there. Yeah. Like so many other species of reptile, all sorts of erroneous beliefs have developed about them. For example, when I was a boy, the wife of one of the local farmers used to tell me how slow worms would go into their dairy and steal milk from the cows. Something that is clearly impossible. We're going to let go. We're going to let go. Oh, 
just separated. These reptiles are quite harmless despite the widely held belief that they can sting. Even Shakespeare claimed this, with the blind worm sting being one of the ingredients thrown into the potion by the infamous three witches in Macbeth. And by the way, it has a very stupid name. It isn't a worm, and they're not particularly slow. The female's very pretty. Yes, gorgeous colour. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Although the numbers have dropped significantly in the UK over the last 50 years, they are still the most common reptiles in this garden. But we have found other interesting things this month. Look at this. This magnificent beetle is a cockchafer or a maybug. They are once far more common than they are today. Because the grubs are particularly fond of root vegetables, they have been considered as a major agricultural pest. Although the adults live for five to seven weeks, the grubs live underground for up to five years. But every 30 years or so, they emerge in their tens of thousands. When he was a boy, the legendary scientist Nikola Tesla made one of his first inventions, an engine powered by four of these beetles. But enough of big beetles and legless lizards, it's time to go to the other side of the world. Graham went to America for three weeks to visit his friend Tom in Arizona. After some desert driving, they then went on a 3,000 mile long trip to Oregon and back. I have always been very fond of the desert states, and whenever I go to America, and it's usually Las Vegas, not because I want to gamble, but because I get asked to appear at UFO and paranormal conferences, I always do my best to sneak away and get out into the desert. The last time I was in Arizona was about 20 years ago, but when I was in this part of the state, people were telling me about their local version of Bigfoot. Except they didn't call it Bigfoot, they called it the Dog-Headed Man. There have been stories of dog-headed men or cynocephali for centuries. Indeed, one of the most famous Christian icons, St Christopher, who allegedly carried the young Christ child across a flooded river in Torrent, and who ever since has been the patron saint of travellers, even though the Second Vatican Council at the beginning of the 1960s actually desanctified him and said that he was purely mythological, and this was probably because he was allegedly a Sinocephalus, a man with a dog's head. These stories that I was told said that these creatures lived in the deepest and most wild parts of the desert, but could still occasionally be seen by travellers who were driving along at dusk or dawn. The stories claimed that these were people rather than animals, but how, why or what they were, nobody seemed to know. It is the very ubiquity of these legends that has always fascinated me. They are found in so many parts of the world, and although it is easy to rationalise them by saying that dogs have been the companions of mankind since before we were actually even half civilised. And so the psychological concept of putting a dog's head on a man's body does not really present a paradigm that's difficult to argue with. However, I still have a nagging doubt in the back of my mind. Could it be possible, could it be even slightly possible, that deep in deserts like these, there is some creature or a primitive human being that could possibly be the origin for these wonderful stories? This is also where, if you're very lucky, you can find the Arizona Jaguar. We talked about this a few episodes ago. It is an incredibly rare animal and people had hoped that conservation efforts would mean that more jaguars would come up from Mexico and breed in Arizona for the first time in well over 50 years. However, the border wall being constructed on the orders of President Trump is likely to put all of that in jeopardy. What makes it even worse is that it appears that one of the only few jaguars known to be living in Arizona has been shot. The rosettes on a jaguar's pelt are unique to each individual, like human fingerprints. 
This allowed officials from the Arizona Game and Fish Department to identify the pelt in a photograph sent to them by the Northern Jaguar Project. When it was alive, it had been photographed several times in Arizona throughout 2016 and 2017. Now, sadly, this beautiful creature has been removed from the gene pool. Unfortunately, the same can't be said for the idiot who shot it. And of course, there's the Mexican wolf. The Mexican wolf, Canis lupus bailei, also known as the lobo, is a subspecies of the grey wolf which was once native to southeastern Arizona, southern New Mexico, western Texas and northern Mexico. It's the smallest of North America's grey wolves and the most primitive. Its ancestors were probably the first grey wolves to enter North America after the extinction of the Beringian wolf, as indicated by its southern range and basal physical and genetic characteristics. Though once held in high regard in pre-Columbian Mexico, it's the most endangered grey wolf in North America, having been extirpated in the wild during the mid-1900s through a combination of hunting, trapping, poisoning and digging pups from dens. After having been listed under the Endangered Species Act in 1976, the United States and Mexico collaborated to capture all the lobos remaining in the wild. This extreme measure prevented the lobo's final extinction. Five wild Mexican wolves, four males and a pregnant female, were captured alive in Mexico from 1977 to 1980 and used to start a captive breeding program. From this program, captive bred Mexican wolves were released into recovery areas in Arizona and New Mexico beginning in 1998 in order to assist the animals' recolonization of their former historical range. As of 2017, there are 143 Mexican wolves living in the wild and 214 captive breeding programs. The Mexican wolf is inextricably linked with the stories of the blue dogs from Texas because this specimen which we photographed during our visit to Texas back in 2010 was found dead and taxidermed by Dr. Phyllis Canyon. DNA analysis suggests that it's a simple hybrid between a coyote and a Mexican wolf. The interesting thing, however, is that Mexican wolves were never found in this part of Texas. So where on earth did the Mexican wolf DNA, which was found incontrovertibly in this specimen, come from? I think the story of the Mexican wolf and the Texas blue dog is far from over, and the answer may well lie here, back in the deserts of Arizona, where Graham each year is exploring more and learning to love so well. And now it's time for a brand new feature for the show. It's time for On The Track Product Placement. There are all sorts of people who are friends and relations of the CFZ and people who are members of the CFZ themselves who do all sorts of peculiar things. And now, each episode, we're going to give a brief roundup of some of these aforementioned things. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, the latest issue of Animals and Men, the journal of the Centre for Fortean Zoology, is available to read free via the CFZ website, the CFZ press website, and the CFZ blog pages. Did we say it was free? It includes articles on blue dogs, man beasts, mystery cats, aquatic monsters, new and rediscovered, 21st century sea serpents, the water of the skies, giant shark reports, and mermaids in the Dutch tradition by Lois Moderman, as well as a report of the second Weird Weekend North, letters to the editor, and book reviews. And it's free. You can't argue with that, can you? Once again, I'd like to ask regular viewers to cast their minds back a few episodes to when we talked about my godson Greg and his visit to Hong Kong. As most of you will know, I lived in Hong Kong when I was a boy, and I still consider it to be my real home now. Indeed, there are times 
important to my dear wife that I wake up in the middle of the night and I'm talking Cantonese, because Cantonese was my milk language. I could chatter away in Cantonese before I was even slightly fluent in English. A few weeks after he returned to England, Greg and his two brothers came over. We all ate Chinese food and they burglarised my liquor cabinet, while Greg then told us the stories of his adventures. As you will probably also remember, Greg, while he was on Hong Kong Island, managed to find and take a photograph of the place which, as a child, I knew as Tadpole Pond, a magical little pool where I used to go fishing together with most of the other young people who lived in the adjacent block of flats. And much to my great pleasure, it's still there. And this inspired me. I decided that what I was going to do was to make the big fish tank in the sitting room a biotope tank based on the fish that I used to catch in Tadpole Pond back 50 years ago. And yes, dear viewers, that's exactly what I've done. The other morning the postman arrived. There was a knock on the door and he said, I've got a special parcel delivery for you. You've got to sign for this. I signed for it. He went off and I got Karina to open the package. Inside the package was a polystyrene transport box and inside that a little plastic bag containing a six small fish. I was massively excited because these are fish that I had not kept, had not even seen, since I left Hong Kong in the early months of 1971. They are mosquito fish. They're not native to Hong Kong. They're actually native to the southern states of the USA. But they've been introduced widely across the world, as the name would imply, in order to keep down numbers of mosquitoes. Anopheles mosquitoes in particular, which spread malaria. Malaria is a filthy disease. My father had a chronic case of recurrent malaria. He was infected in Nigeria in the 1950s and continued having bites of the disease intermittently until he died. And that was only 12 years ago. In Martin Booth's delightful story of his childhood in Hong Kong, he writes how he used to explore the streams and ponds in what used to be the gardens of the governor's summer quarters off the top of Victoria Peak, and how he was surprised to find small grey fish living quite happily in some of these ponds. How, he asked, did it fish get up to the top of the mountain? None of Hong Kong's natural species, or very few of them, have ever been found that far up. In fact, in all the years I lived and investigated the freshwater zoology of Hong Kong, I only ever found one native fish up there, a gastromyzon hillstream loach. But what we did find a lot were the fish which Martin Booth had found. Peace. And although Martin has been dead for many years, if you're listening, mate, somewhere up in the afterlife, if there is such a thing, I can answer your question. They were put up there in the 1920s by the British colonial government in order to keep down the mosquito levels, because it would never have done for mad dogs and Englishmen, particularly the governor in charge of the aforementioned mad dogs and Englishmen, to have died of malaria. I used to catch them at Tadpole Pond, and I was fascinated to see how they lived their complex little lives and I've wanted to keep them ever since. But sadly, they're very, very rare in the aquarium trade. Why is this, you ask? They're not at all rare in the wild. Well, is it because they're worried that the fish will have malaria, asked Charlotte. Well, that's actually a really good question, but no. The answer's much more simple than this. Are they not easy to keep in captivity, asked Charlotte. Nope, they're one of the easiest fish to keep. In fact, they were the first tropical fish, or actually subtropical fish, to be kept in aquaria in the UK. Now, the answer is far more simple. It's the fact that the aquarium trade has got far more sophisticated in the past half century, and these fish are small, 
grey and don't actually do anything. And what's worse, if you keep them with larger, prettier fish like angelfish, for example, they get aggressive and nick their fins. And sadly, with the aquarium trade being run on strictly market forces based lines, there isn't much of a market for small grey fish that attack everything else that you put in with them. And only strange folk like me, and as Charlotte and Karina and everybody else who works with me will probably be only too keen to attest, I can be a little strange at times, only strange people like me actually want to keep fish like these. Which I think is a great pity, because they're one of the favourite species that I have ever kept. And now, over to Karina for our regular monthly visit to Watcher of the Skies. I wish it was Watcher of some Tramps. I have always felt a curious affinity with this species of bird, probably because for 30 years I was a secretary, and this is a secretary bird, a highly specialised ground-dwelling bird of prey from an older family than the other Old World raptors. It is native to sub-Saharan Africa and is sadly non-migratory, so will never be a natural visitor to these shores. But I think you'd be surprised quite how many completely unexpected avian visitors Britain does have. And that's what this segment on the track is all about. Bernard Hoivermans himself said that cryptozoology wasn't the study of monsters, but the study of unexpected animals. And in the UK, what could be more unexpected than vultures, spoonbills and albatrosses? Yes, even the kings of the Southern Ocean have been seen in British waters. Two species of albatross have been recorded in the UK in recent years. Not all of our feathered visitors are quite so spectacular, but nearly every day there is something exciting to greet the watcher of the skies. And hello everyone. During late June, a rare bird Open bushy habitats. Very 
Oxford Scotland has announced that a white tail eagle chick has successfully hatched in Orkney for the first time in over 140 years. One chick has been seen, however, local RSPB Scotland staff believe from watching the parents' behaviour that there may be two. It's been five years since these birds reappeared in Orkney after an absence of 95 years. The species was wiped out in the UK when the last bird was shot in Shetland in 1918, and it's thanks to a reintroduction program begun in the 70s that the birds are once again found in Scotland. The pair had been seen in Hawaii every year since 2013, but nesting attempts in 2015 and 16 were both unsuccessful and common occurrence for young birds. After the last white tail eagles in the UK were driven to extinction in the early 20th century, 82 birds were reintroduced from Norway between 1975 and 1985. They first bred successfully in 1985 on the Isle of Mull and established territories on a number of islands on the west coast. Additional releases in Western Ross and Fife in subsequent decades further expanded their range and there are now over 100 breeding pairs on the UK's largest bird of prey in Scotland. A pied crow has been dubbed as being incredibly well travelled after heading south through the Spurn bottleneck, East Yorkshire and Gibraltar Point, Lincolnshire on the 13th. Reappearing in Norfolk in the vicinity of Great Yarmouth's race course from the 15th to the 17th. And then flying north over Winston to see the 18th before reappearing around the Chrome Chip Shop on the 19th. They then moved a short distance to East London during the same evening. A sub Saharan resident, Hyde Crow has a controversial history in the Western Palearctic. A number of Moroccan occurrences are considered generally, as is a sprinkling of other North African records from northern Mauritania to Egypt. Most recently, a pair was seen a couple of months ago on the Italian island of Lampedusa. These show a considerable northward movement of almost 1,000 miles from the species' usual range. However, all Iberian records have been assumed to be escapes, including birds seen across the Straits of Gibraltar. It seems an unlikely natural vagrant to Britain and the likelihood of the ship assistance must be considered. There are currently three birds in residence near Puerto de la Luz on the Gran Canaria Canary Islands, which arrived on a mobile oil rig that had been moored off the Mauritania coast. Despite multiple records of ship assisted birds elsewhere in the world, including several Brazilian records, the species is also commonly kept in captivity. Several British records have been successfully traced back to their owners, including one at the start of Point of Devon in 2006, and has escaped from the by Avery. The last Yorkshire record, a bird that appeared at Flamborough on 8th of May 1999, which drove both of its way south through Spur, also attracted attention, until another turned up in Derbyshire on the 26th of May, and it was established that two have escaped from the wildlife rescue centre. And that is it for this episode. And now it is over to Jonathan of the usual and you and we rediscovered species. So I should say farewell. And so does prove that even though it looks like she's gone there, she's going to sleep. A new species of the cyprinid genus Pethia has been described from the Harayan Kiashi, a tributary of the Krishna River system in the Western Ghats mountain ranges of Peninsula India. The new species, Pethia sahit, is syntopic and shoals together with Pethia longicorda, a species described recently from the same river system. Pethia sahit is distinguished from P. longicorda, however, and its congeners by a combination of several different characters. Still on the Indian subcontinent, the discroglossidae frogs of the genus Ferdivaria bolcav are morphologically cryptic and represented by one of the widespread group of frogs across tropical Asia, comprising about 45 species. Being morphologically cryptic, taxonomic status for many of the species remains uncertain. 
Recent studies using integrative taxonomic approaches have revealed the existence of many novel and hitherto undescribed species. Two new species of Fregivaria, Fregivaria kalinga and Fregivaria krishnan from Peninsula India have been found to be morphologically and phylogenetically distinct. A new species of Lentic salamander of the genus Hynobius has been found in Japan from examination specimens from the Kaiushi and Shikoku populations of Hynobius dunai, individuals of each population have distinct morphological and molecular traits. On this basis, the Shikoku population has been described as a new species. Morphological comparisons can reveal that most individuals of H. dunai possess distinct black spots in the dorsum, but that the new species lacks those spots. Back to India, two new cryptic species of the Agamid genus Sitana from Peninsula India have been described. Sitana gokensis and Goka kanataka closely resemble Sitana fondalu from Najana Sagar, Adra Pradesh. The two species can be distinguished based on their subtle morphological differences, genetic difference and geographic distribution. Satana gotanensis has a relatively depressed head compared to Satana fondalu. Additionally, the vertical scale counts differ in speed males of the two new species. A new species of rock-dwelling gecko, Hemidactylus paragauli, has been described from the Agastial Mali hill range in the southern western Ghats. Morphological and molecular data support the distinctiveness of the species and its close relationship to other large-bodied tuberculate Hemidactylus species from the Hayrashihadi group from India and Sri Lanka. Sphenopomorphus yusini is a new forest skink described from Kamahoa province, southern Vietnam. Based on morphological characters of four specimens and a fragment of 653 nucleotides of the gene at COI, this new species is named in honour of the famous physician and bacteriologist Alexandre Yersin, that's who lived from 1863 to 1943, who discovered the bacterium responsible for bubonic plague and had a research station on the same mountain where these lizards were discovered. The neotropical genus Pseudopalacadola includes 21 species which occur throughout South America. Recent studies suggested that the population of Andari, a little frog found in the state of Bahia, is an undescribed species related to P. Pocoto. Neither is this new species from the lowlands of eastern Brazil. Recognition of the new species is supported by adult morphology, advertisement call, carrier type and molecular data. The specific name honours Antoine Hercule Remold Florence, better known as Hercule Florence, a French artist, painter, polyographer and inventor who is acknowledged as the inventor of photography in Brazil back in the 19th century. The recent description of Curlodactylus tahuna from Sahigny Island and descriptions of two other new species of gecko from remote islands in the Indo-Australian archipelago indicate the important role of oceanic dispersal and isolation in the evolution and diversification of the genus Cyrtodactylus. Now another example has been found involving a Tanawahaya Jempa Island a remote island 155 kilometers south of the southwestern peninsula of Sulawesi, Indonesia. Here a new species is described on the basis of 11 specimens collected from that island. This new species is an intermediate-sized Cyrtodactylus with a snout vent length of up to 76.1 millimeters in adult males and 72.8 millimeters in females. It is easily distinguished from all recognised species occurring on Sulawesi as well as in the Moluccas and Lesser Sunda Islands. Schistiura larcatensis is a new species of Caverniculus loach and is described from Kum, a limestone cave in Meghalaya in India. The species that differs from Schistiura papalofria, its only troglomorphic congener from northwest India, 
In having a smooth ventral surface of the head, the presence of a small cylindrical axillary pelvic lobe and the presence of three pores in the supratemporal canal of the cephalic lateral line system. Apart from these differences, the species can be immediately distinguished from all other species of the Shiskira from the Barmahutra River and neighbouring basins by the complete absence or only vestigial presence of eyes. Unresolved taxonomy of threatened species is problematic for conservation at the best of time as the field relies on species being distinct taxonomic units. Differences in breeding habitat and results from a preliminary molecular analysis have indicated that the New Zealand population of the South Georgian diving petrel, Pelicanoides georgicus, is a distinct yet undescribed species. All known study skins of P. wenhanuensis originate from either Dundas Island, Enderby Island, which are both apart from the Auckland Islands in New Zealand, or Codfish Island, New Zealand. P. huenuensis remains extant only on Codfish Island, where it breeds in a minute strip of coastal sandy fore dunes in Sealers Bay. The historic distribution of the species in New Zealand likely encompassed the entire Tega Peninsula on South Island, Mason's Bay on Stewart Island, Enderby and Dentus Islands on the Auckland Islands and the Chatham Islands. The offshore distribution of the species remains unknown. Prey species found in two specimens indicate that P. huanuensis forages on the edge of the continental shelf during the breeding season. The only documented record of P. georgicus for Australia likely pertained to being P. huanuensis based on the reported biometrics, most notably a tail length of only 41 millimetres indicating at least considerable frequency potential and perhaps a larger offshore distribution than previously assumed. Megophrys lancip from the Bukit Parisian mountain range of southwestern Sumatra is described on the basis of molecular and morphological evidence. The new species is distinguished from its congeners in Sumatra, Java, Borneo and the Philippines by having a medium-sized body, snipe with an extremely pointed rostral appendage, a medium-sized triangular eyelid appendage, a dorsolateral fold to stay extending from just behind the eye to the groin, vermarine teeth, focal slits, nuptial pads on the dorsomedial surface of the first and second fingers in males, and in lacking an X, Y or H shaped fold on the or dorsum. The new species is known from the provinces of Lampung and Benkulu in southwest Sumatra. Larval, acoustic and other ecological data are sadly unknown. The holotype was collected from a coffee plantation near the edge of secondary forest. This new species of Macophis can be found sympatrically with M. Nasuta in Kuku Prahu Bukit Parisian Salatan National Park. Habitat loss and exploitation of the species for the pet trade are likely to be the main threat to this newly discovered frog. I would like to also point out that whereas every effort has been made to contact the copyright holders of these photographs, we believe that we are justified in reproducing them in this not-for-profit video using the policy of fair use. However, if there is anybody who believes that their intellectual or legal rights have been infringed, please contact us and we will do our best to bring the matter to a mutually acceptable solution. But first, there's this. Richard will be back from Tajikistan and Charlotte encounters some tenophores. And this. Ever since we restarted this show back in the summer, we've been telling you how Louis was going to set up a Patreon campaign. Well, he's done it. And you can come, see what he's done, and hopefully support us in a very real way at this address. Thank you, guys. And by the way, whilst we're on the subject of Louis, he's in Atlanta, Georgia again this summer. And look what he sent me. He found it the other morning. 
It's a female of the local species of Hercules beetle. A very magnificent creature, I think so anyway. Thank you, Louis, for sharing her with us. But now over to Charlotte. Thank you for watching this month's episode, and we hope you do enjoyed it. Make sure to subscribe, click that like button, and to click the bell so you get notified whenever we upload a new video. Please also share this video on social media. We've also made a Facebook page, so you can go check that out. Thank you, and goodbye. Well, ladies and gentlemen, it's been a strange old month. We've had car problems, computer problems, equipment problems, and camera problems. But apart from that, things have gone quite well. I'd like to say thank you to everybody who's been involved in this episode. And yes, ladies and gentlemen, I hope you've enjoyed it. Because we always enjoy putting it together for you. And it's great when we get feedback. Thank you very much to everybody, not just who's worked on this episode, but who have supported the CFZ and our endeavours around the world in the last month. Thanks, guys. We really can't do it without you. We've got some exciting times coming back. We won't hear anything from Richard until the day he comes back to England from Tajikistan. So I've got no idea, he's out there at this moment, I've got no idea whether they've had a massively successful time or completely the opposite, or somewhere in between. But next month we'll be able to tell you all about it. We've got some other exciting things in the offing as well. So I very much look forward to being able to tell you all about it. But until then, it's seeing you.